responded. Uh, Pray for for Carol Robinson's family. They're all there. She's in the last stages. I just hope that she does okay. I mean, that the family's okay. And Gail, it's gonna go hard for her.
you know, we all go through trials. Probably no one in here or no one that I know has ever not gone through one. Could be a sickness, divorce, losing a job, a divorce, death. Uh, but we all go through trials in our life. Uh, I believe it was Mother Teresa that said, God won't put on us more than we can stand. I just wish you didn't trust me so much. And so that's, that's one of the things that I say sometimes. Um, I uh, wanted to uh, share with you uh, the jail ministry that I was involved in for over 20 years. And um, the first time that I went to jail, um, many times after that, but the first time I went, my uh, sister-in-law, Olivia Trapp, asked me if I would go with her and share my testimony. So I did, and I thought, you know, that won't be hard. Just, you know, go in and talk to the women and, and go home. Well, the minute that I walked through those doors, it was very intimidating. First of all, you're searched. Next, the doors clang shut behind you, and you realize that the only way you're going to get out is if they open those doors. <laughs> and I was like, oh, please, have the doors open when I'm ready to leave. And so uh, we uh, went in there, I uh, shared my testimony, and I remember going home that night and just how burdened my heart was for the ladies, the women that are in there. They're broken, they're shattered, there are so many different things that they're going through. And do most of them deserve to be in there? Probably so. Could I have found myself sitting in there? Probably so. So. Uh, I, it, it really had an impact on my heart and shortly after that uh, Olita asked me if I would like to join her team and go in every month and uh, share with these women and I did and uh, we, we had a pretty good team going we would do a Bible study and uh, play music worship Jesus and just, you know, have a, it was just really uh, fulfilling, you know, knowing that I knew that God put me in there. And um, uh, it, like I said, we did it for over 20 years. Um, I want to talk to you <clears throat> about one particular service that I was in. And, um, she had called me, it was on a Sunday afternoon, and asked me if I would like to go with her to the jail that night. And it wasn't our turn. As a matter of fact, it was on Easter Sunday. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to go tonight, it's Easter. <laughs> I want to be with my family. You know, I just didn't want to go. And she said, oh, come on, you know, we can, we can go, we can do this. So I. I didn't really have time to plan a lesson, so I thought, well, I'll give my testimony, because it had been several years since I had done that. So, uh, first, first off, I would like to say, it's not about me, and it's not about anything that I did. It's about God, and His timing, and what He wanted. And so, I, uh, I went and I uh, was sharing about Brian, our son, and uh, it, uh, it was quite a service. I, had, I was sharing uh, what had happened. Uh, year, a few years earlier, or quite a few years earlier, actually. And before I get into that service, I just want to say that 
Brian, um, he was five years old when Mika and I got married. He was 10 um, when the things that happened happened. And um, he, he was almost not born. Uh, in my first marriage, we had three little girls. Three little girls died, three funerals, and when I found out that I was going to have another baby, my doctors advised an abortion. And so close did we go, not go through that. Um, but I just couldn't. I couldn't do that. Um, if I had had at the time, you know, there weren't sonograms, so you didn't know it's 1973, and you didn't know what you were going to have until you had it. And so um, when I was, you know, talking, praying to God about what to do in this circumstance. Um, I knew that I had to give it everything that I could give. I had to have that baby. If he, if the baby died after he was born, then I did everything in my power <coughs> to bring him life. And so I didn't have the abortion. And my family was not happy with me. But I did what I had to do. And so, uh, when Brian was born, he was a normal, healthy, beautiful baby boy. And he was such a blessing in our life. He was a normal, get in trouble kind of little boy that did what he was going to do. And, uh, but that was fine with us. And um, so, on that Easter Sunday, <coughs> Uh, given my testimony, I uh, told Brian's story, and this is Brian's story. Uh, it was March the 26th, 1984, and it was the first Monday after spring break. And in the past, there had been a lady that lived in our neighborhood that watched him after school, but she had moved during spring break, and we had been looking for someone to take care of him. And we hadn't. So uh, Mickey would get home from his job about 30 minutes after Brian got home. So we decided that it would be okay for him to come home and Mickey come home right afterwards. So um, I had talked with Brian and told him, okay, this is what you have to do. You get home from school, you can have a snack, you call me first thing, and uh, so I know that you're home and know you're safe. And he did, and he called and he said, Mom, I'm home. I said, okay, let's do our homework and Mickey will be home in a few minutes. And he said, I love you, Mom. I said, I love you too. And he said, can I ride my three-wheeler this afternoon? You see, he had been grounded from his three-wheeler for 30 days because he had been jumping these big piles of dirt behind our house. And so he had been grounded from running his little three-wheeler. So I said, we'll talk about it when I get home. He said, okay, Mom. So uh, a few minutes later, maybe 10 minutes later, I got a phone call from a neighbor. And my neighbor said, uh, your house is on fire. And uh, uh, I tried, the first thing I did was try to call Mickey. I didn't have a car at work. So uh, I got, uh, I couldn't reach Mickey. And um, I got a co worker to take me home. So when we got to the house, it was up in flames. There was firefighters, police officers, neighbors, family, everybody out in the streets, out in the yard. And the first thing I tried to do was to go in the house. And there was a fireman there who said, you can't, you can't go in. You know, you, you can't go in. So 
walk. I know son's in there, and I, you know, I need in. Well, he didn't let me in, so I was just really not knowing what to do at that time, and I saw Mickey pull up, and uh, he got out of the car, and they had been looking for Brian, and uh, he had Brian's friend with him, and so, um, um, they, um, you know, it, it, it takes such a toll on your emotions and your, in shock, because you, you just can't comprehend everything that's going on. So, uh, it took a few years later for me to remember something a police officer said that was standing in front of me. He told my family, you need to get her out of here. And so my sister-in-law, Olivia, she said, let's go to my house and we'll wait there. And I said, no, I can't leave. You know, if Brian comes back, he's going to be, he'll be devastated because he didn't know where I am, where I would be and she said it'll be okay so we get in the car and uh, we drive to her house and I get out of the car and I saw my mom pull up at the end of the driveway and, she, and I'm running down the driveway because I know he's in that car and so she gets out of the car and her head is hung down and so when we reach each other and I look up I knew he wasn't there. He wasn't there. And this is what happened that we heard, you know, later. Brian, Brian was very smart. He was in the Excel program at school. He was an honor student. He made very good grades. But for some reason, he had decided to burn a paper. And so at our house, there was a breezeway between the kitchen, it's on one side, and then at the other end, we'd just go out into the yard. So he, uh, there was a, a rug, a runner that was down the, the breezeway, and that's where he was burning the paper. And um, he poured gasoline on it instead of the fire. And immediately it started flaming. And so he took his little foot and tried to stomp it out. And his pant leg and his shoe caught on fire. And he tried it, he got it out and he decided to go in the, the kitchen door, get a glass of water and come out and put it on the flames. And um, that made it worse, you know. So the little boy that had uh, been there before Mickey got there, um, he uh, told Brian, he said, I'm gonna go around the house, go in the front door, and get something to smother it out. Well, he, he came back out and he said, I can't find anything. And he told Brian, we've got to go get help. So, by this time, the kitchen door was flaming. The whole breezeway was on fire. And the only way that Brian had to get out is run through the flames. That's the only way he had to get out. And on the uh, other side, uh, the, Mickey had a little workshop. And we don't know exactly what happened at that point, but knowing Brian the way that I do, um, I believe he w walked in that workshop and thought, I'll be fine. They're going for help. They're coming after me. I'll be okay. The next thing that happened was the gasoline can exploded. And he, um, 
was found in the workshop underneath the shelf. And, of course, he was gone. And, uh, I mean, picture this. I'm telling this story in my jail ministry class. And you could hear a pin drop. It's so quiet. And so I, fin I finished the story and just basically, you know, standing there waiting for the class to be over. And I looked at the back of the room, which the, the jail rooms, uh, we did the, uh, the women at the Dent County Jail. And so there was two ladies in the back that were really upset. And one of them was comforting this young lady back there. And she was motioning for me to come back there. Well, the rules are you not to go out to the back, stay at the front, uh, no touching, no hugging, no anything like that. That's not allowed. But she kept motioning for me to come back there, and I just kept standing where I was. And finally she came up to me, and she said, please come to the back. Will you please come to the back? And I'm like, okay, okay. So I go to the back of the room. And this young lady, she said, she's just really out of control. And she said, Sharon. I'm like, yes. She said, I'm Alina. I said, okay. And she said, Brian was my brother. And she was five years old when Brian died. She and her dad would come and get Brian for weekends and stuff. So we were familiar with each other, but I hadn't seen her in a long, long time. She was all grown up. And so she, her mother wouldn't let her go to the funeral, the bride's funeral. This was the first time she had ever heard this story. She had never heard how Brian died. She knew he died, and she, but she didn't know how, how he died. And so we, we became very close. After that, I would go visit her a lot, and she turned her life around, and she is, she moved to Florida a few years ago, and she's uh, doing well. But, you know, I did not want to be there that day. God wanted me there that day. And all the years that I had been in that ministry, not one time had she been in my class. Not one time, but she was there that day to hear the story of her brother. So, you know, it, it's overwhelming. And if I was hearing somebody tell this story, I would be thinking, right. <laughs> because it's just so many, so many things that had to be in place for that day, for that to happen. And I am so thankful that I was there. I'm thankful that I listened to God and I did what He had me do. He wanted me there and I was there. And um, I just I wanted to um, share a couple of scriptures with you. One is Genesis 50:20 that says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And she did accept Christ as her Savior. She, she is a Christian, and she wasn't before, before that day. Not to me, but what God can do and what he did that day. And um, I'm eternal, eternally grateful for having a small part in, in that. And um, 
I want to thank you for allowing me to share my testimony today with you. And uh, it's, it's been an honor for me, Mickey, and I love our new family here. And we consider all of you our family, and we just, we're so blessed to be here in this fellowship. Uh, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live that Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Thank you. Give 
What you made in my life What a difference you made in my life You're my sunshine Day and night What a difference you made In my life What a change you made What a change you have made in my heart You've replaced all the broken parts What a change you have made in my heart